Good evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled board of the, of the meeting of the Board of Education. Um, first thing I'd ask folks is turn off their cell, if they would, and stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd ask the secretary to call the roll. Okay. President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Branstad. Here. Secretary Gorton. I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member McFarland. Not here. No. And Member Singer. Here. We have a quorum. There's no quorum. Um, moving on, uh, we have on the consent agenda tonight before we open the meeting to public comments. Uh, approval of last meeting minutes, uh, some staff resignations, uh, tenure teacher requested leave of absences, they're listed in your agenda. Fine books were presented for 28 period on May 12th, uh, now for approval. <coughs> the district's two-year service contract with CMI, a York Risk Services company, formerly Citizens Management of Howe, Michigan, uh, was, um, was renewed in June of 2013. And uh, we're looking for approval of one-year contract with this employer to provide excess workers' comp coverage uh, in that period. Uh, bids have been accepted in tabulation for the Midland Community Stadium concession building roof replacement and looking for approval of that. Bids were recently received from lamp vendors to provide fluorescent linear T8 lamps for our district facilities and uh, to accept that bid. <coughs> and bids were recently accepted from pest management service providers for district integrated pest management services and uh, acceptance of that bid. Uh, also for Midland Paper and approval of the school systems bills for April as tabulated and lastly approval of authorized payments for filing legal bills of 4400 and some dollars to Troon Law Firm and $250 to Posit Dyer and Kanar and Garshaw PLC. I'll accept the motion in a second and we can move in any discussion if there is any. I move we accept consent, <coughs> consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.11. I second that. Any discussion or additions or deletions to that consent agenda? See none, move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All, all opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. Now we'll move into request to address the board. We have one uh, formal request tonight of Ms. Lisa Arnold to address the board. She come forward please. Please restrict your comments to five minutes and tell us where your school attendance area is. My name is Lisa Arnold. Um, I live on Columbia and we are in Plymouth Northeast and Midland High area. Um, as you may recall, I spoke to you at the previous board meeting regarding the Great Lakes Bay Early College. Um, I'd like to um, thank you for listening to me again about this topic. Um, I've since learned a little bit more that I'd like to share with you about it. That it's credentialed by the Michigan Early Middle College Association, which um, works within the Michigan Department of Education and is one of the first early college programs in Michigan, the um, Michigan Early Middle College Association is. Not all early college programs have credentials from that um, association. Um, I did um, ask to bring up handout with more information on that if you're interested. That um, the Great Lakes Bay Early College is um, considered successful because 92% of its students successfully complete their college uh, classes with a C or better. And it is a quality program that is good uh, for at-risk and high-achieving students as well. And that students and st instructors I've talked to who teach um, Gleebeck students believe the program is successful and necessary. Um, I've been told that communication between MPS and Gleebeck has been strained, and we all need good communication between teachers, counselors, administrators, and education partners. And um, you know, our, my question is how can needs addru be addressed with poor communication? I've also been told that since MPS is no longer participating with the program, they feel the way is shut, there's no way to rejoin the um, consortium. However, there is precedence in the past, um, with the recent past, within the past um, two to three years, that Ann Arbor schools um, bowed out of the uh, um, 
Michigan Early Middle College Association Association as well. However, um, they did that in the spring. But however, during the summer, they did change their mind and they were allowed to rejoin their, um, their early college association and students were allowed to attend through that in the fall of that same year. So I'm feeling that with maybe some communication with Great Lakes Bay that that could still happen for the MPS students who applied for that and were accepted. And um, so I'm just appealing to you to do that. I've given you some contact numbers for the program director and the program manager. And um, I'm just hoping that you're willing to make a commitment to resolve issues so that students have this option to them in the future. Thank you. All right, before I start, I just want to say I really hope it's not pride that keeps you from going back into this program because I'm the one who applied and I was very disappointed when I couldn't get in. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee Arnold. I'm in 10th grade and attend Midland High School. I was raised not to dis dispute the teachings or ways of teachers or authoritative figures in the school until now. I'm in all IB honors or advanced classes, and for the most part, I'm very successful. I work hard for the grades that I get, but I have decided that the IB program isn't really for me. It limits my class choices, and it's pretty stressful, which I understand that the college life would be too, but it would be a little less structured, and I would be more independent. I decided some time ago that I would like to enter the Great Lakes Bay Early College Program. The independent atmosphere and easy transition from high school to college life was appealing to me. After speaking with other participants and attending the informational meeting at SPSU, my decision became solidified. I would apply to the program. So I did, and I was accepted. Upon getting my acceptance email, I was also informed by my parents that MPS had chosen not to participate in the Great Lakes Bay Early College Program any longer. I was confused, so I asked why. I was told that one of the reasons this program was cut was due to poor communication. Where is this gap? I had received the informational packet from my counselor. She was the one who told me when and where the informational meeting was. I got my transcript for the application from the counselor's office, and they were fully aware of what it was for. So you can kind of see why I'm confused. This program was dropped because of poor communication, yet it wasn't communicated throughout the school system, and especially to me and the other students that applied, that this program was dropped. I don't find the answer of poor communication sufficient. If I were to skip every assignment in which I experienced what I saw of as poor teacher to student communication, I wouldn't be doing a quarter of my assignments. So that's why I ask questions, whether it be of my teachers, my peers, or even my family members. I'm more often than not able to sort out the problem. In fact, it usually turns out that I just misunderstood a part of the instructions. Could it be that MPS merely misunderstood this program? I'd like this program to be reopened for this year, and what I'm asking for is an effort. I would like to see an effort in, to communicate put in. This program, if this program is reopened as it should be, I'm 100% willing to work directly with any administrator to make the path of communication more direct and, if at all, easier. If the reopening would were to occur and the MPS administrative staff continues to find this program unfitting for them, I'm asking for a public closing of the program. Don't make it quiet like you did this time. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any comment at this time on that? Do you have any comment at this time on that? No. Okay. I'll, I'll give her an answer and look into some of the things they mentioned. So, Mike, we'll be getting back with you. Yep. Okay. Presentations <coughs> of the board. I turn it over to Mike. We have quite a few tonight, so we're going to keep you busy here. And we'll start off with our um, Shining Star employees. And first up is Julie, Julie McDonald. <laughs> You get to stand here and I get to read all kinds of good things about you. Okay. Julie McDonald is a dedicated, respected member of Midland Public Schools family. Julie began her office professional career at the NPS Administration Center in August of 1988 as a half-time food service secretary. In 1992, Mrs. McDonald moved into the position of video booking clerk in the NPS Media Center. In 1994, she moved to the position of secretary for the manager of building maintenance in the service division. In 1997, Julie was the secretary to be the director of facilities and operations and moved into the front row at the administration center. In 2003, Julie moved into the position of the office technical professional for the human resources office. And in 2006, she returned to her high school alma mater, H.H. Dow High School. But this time as the super supervising office technical professional, the position she holds today. As you can gather from this, 
more than 26 year journey down Julie's MPS professional memory lane. She has touched the lives of many Midland Public Schools, students, staff, families, and community members. One of Julie's first, very first supervisors remarked more than 26 years ago, Julie has a great rapport with others. It is always pleasant to see her smile on the front line. In her current position, her supervisor recently remarked, the Dow High School office under her supervision is an efficient, warm, inviting, and welcoming atmosphere for the community, parents, students, and staff at Dow High. Her supervisor goes on to say that Julie has genuine charger spirit and models it each and every day with strength, pride, integrity, respect, intensity, and tradition in everything she does every day at Dow High. Julie's warm, caring, efficient ways noted in 1988 continue today and radiates to those she supervises and comes in contact with at DHS. Julie was nominated for the Shining Star by an MPS colleague. Among her comments, the staff member wrote, Julie goes above and beyond 24-7 at Dow High. She manages to balance all the duties in the main office with nonstop interruptions. She is polite, professional, and caring. She always keeps her students and teachers' best interests paramount to all, all of her daily responsibilities. And her contributions to our school and MPS are numerous. She emulates charger spirit in all her duties at DHS. She truly displays sincere dedication and commitment to Dow High students and staff. That is second to none. Congratulations to Julie. Thank you. This, this, and you get to go around and say Okay? All the board members are all around the table. Thanks. And as I learned in the MPS's way, we honored one side of town, we're going to honor the other side of town. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have, uh, next up is Janet Greif. Oh, wow. I don't know if I can say Mrs. Grace, so I might have to use Janet multiple times here. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Janet's professional career in education began in February of 1995, where she taught an extended day program for at-risk kindergarten students at MPS's Longview Elementary School. In the fall of 1995, she was hired as a Title I teacher for Westdale Elementary School and Saginaw Township Community Schools. In 2000, she began her school administration career as an elementary principal with Bay City Public Schools. Mrs. Greif's MPS administration career began in 2004 as the assistant principal at Central Middle School. In 2006, she moved into the principal's position at Plymouth Elementary, and in 2009, she took it to the helm of Northeast Middle School. In 2010, Mrs. Greif took over the leadership role in Midland High, High School as the MPS principal, the position she holds today. Janet graduated from Saginaw Valley State University in 1995 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in elementary education. In 1998, Janet earned her master's degree in educational leadership from Saginaw Valley State University. During the 2007-2008 school year, Janet was chosen to participate in the Gerstacker Fellowship Leadership Program. As part of this demanding year-long program, Janet traveled to China and Taiwan to experience firsthand educational practices in another part of the world. One of Janet's supervisors remarked, Janet is both an effective building manager and a strong educational leader. She's a hard worker and a great problem solver. She multitasks well, and most importantly, she cares about children. I have thoroughly enjoyed working with her. Another supervisor stated she has garnered the respect of staff, students, and parents. She is a tireless worker that attends and supervises numerous after-school events. Her leadership is an asset to the entire, entire district. Janet was nominated for the Shining Star Award by an MPS colleague. This person wrote, Janet truly has the best interests of Midland High staff, students and families in the forefront of everything she does. She's an amazing administrator who leads by example. Through a very difficult spring at Midland High School, where, where Midland High School lost a treasured staff member to cancer, Janet made sure the students, staff, and families were cared for and supported. Janet made sure the ceremony commencing Mrs. Sisko's life and her wonderful contributions to Midland High School were celebrated in a lovely and memorable way for all those who were in attendance. Janet is a gifted educator and a valued member of the MPS family. Congratulations to Janet. <laughs> Dow High School one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and this one will be short and brief, but um, um, 
Pam, if you want to step in here, you can as well. We're, Pam is very proud. I um, kind of uh, encouraged Pam to, to apply for this award, and she did so, and she uh, chose uh, Missy DeVoyer's program at the school, and it won the MASB Educational Excellence Award, and I think Lynn and Pam were down in Lansing when they received the award as well, and so it was quite a high honor. Anything you want to say to that? And uh, Missy did a PBL lesson as well, so you know we've been really working hard on project-based learning, and that was, so that was a nice piece of that as well. Well, we're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to have Northeast present, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Jeff Jaster. We are going back and forth on while it, while it comes up, Pam, I did see that in the office the other day, and it made me scratch my head. So I'm uh, at graduation, so I'm glad to see what it's up there for. You forgot to put it out in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Thanks for uh, having us tonight. I'm excited to, to be here to present our middle school version of Genius Hour. I'm even more excited for the kids behind me to be able to talk to you about it. That's really what this is about. But um, Genius Hour, just really quickly, is not a new concept in the business world. Um, it's also sometimes referred to as FedEx time. Uh, but what I think is unique about what these kids have done this year is they've taken the middle school iPad pilot. And with the help of Robin Bott and Deborah Finn, their two teachers, who, by the way, are both sixth grade social studies teachers. So there was a lot of opportunity for collaboration. They've taken this idea and really made it into something special. So I'm going to turn this over to Robin and Deborah and let them fill you in on the details. Hi, I'm Deborah Finn. I'm a sixth grade teacher at Northeast Social Studies and Language Arts. Just a little quick backstory to the iPad. Um, we were presented with the iPad initiative, and Mrs. Bott and I uh, were the fortunate winners, and so we <laughs> got to share them with the kids. We're, we're, aren't we excited about it? Yeah, we are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So we started in social studies, and the kids, we thought, had a really good feeling for one sky drive turned one drive, um, Nearpod, Edmodo, all kinds of apps that are on there. And the kids were really proficient. If ever something went wrong, the kids could fix it before I could. OK, yeah, but we would collaborate. But <laughs> the kids were really good at it. And we decided, you know what? We're doing so much in social studies. Let's spread it on. So we went on to English. And from there comes Genius Hour. Um, when we started trying to figure out how to morph this into something bigger for the kids, we realized um, that Deborah and I had really done a lot of the learning ourselves on the iPads. And the kids had been more on the receiving end of what we had been learning. And we wanted them to have a chance to use them the iPads as a tool to learn themselves and to create presentations that they could do for the world. So uh, we started researching uh, with project-based learning and this Google <coughs> and FedEx 20% time and playing around with all those ideas and morphed them together all into one big conglomerate called Genius Hour that is still changing. Um, we incorporated, um, we started with the two of us, um, but then we have two separate teams. We have 200 kids all together, and all the language arts teachers on our teams were able to do Genius Hour with their language arts classes because the kids already knew how to use the iPads from social studies. So the kids could teach the teachers what they needed to know to be able to run Genius Hour. And the iPads are on wheels, so it's really easy. Really easy. <laughs> so what we would like to do for you today, um, before we turn it over to the kids who are the real stars of the show, uh, is just show you how we introduced the idea to them. Uh, and then you'll get to hear from them their perspective on what it is that they were able to accomplish in the second half of this year. Thank you. 
I'm Luca Jolly. I'm in sixth grade at Northeast Middle School. And as you have seen from this PowerPoint, my classmates and I are here to talk about Genius Hour. So Genius Hour worked pretty much in four simple steps. First, we came up with a fact question, which was our idea. Then we did research. Then we put together a presentation. And then we presented it. I've done a lot of Genius Hour presentations, and they all started out with a burning question. And here are some of my questions I did. What makes Candy Crush Saga so addicting? <laughs> the process, how it like does, how is a Broadway show processed? How to take care of and show Rabbit? And I'm currently working on what it takes to become a ballet dancer. My favorite presentation so far has been how to take care of and show rabbits because rabbits are my favorite animals and I raised rabbits and I was really curious about the topic. In class, our, our teachers encouraged us to have human resources and visuals so I interviewed my friend who shows and breeds rabbits, and I brought in one of my rabbits for my rabbit presentation. And so I really, really, really like Genius Hour. It's one of my favorite times of the week, and it's really fun. And there was, so there was this one day where it was this Wednesday, and Wednesdays are our usual day for Genius Hour. And there was a snow day, and I was like, yay, I don't have school, but I was kind of sad because I didn't get to do Genius Hour, and it was really fun, and I like it. And I've learned a lot from using the iPads and from doing Genius Hour. Like, the right information won't always be online, and apps sometimes just will fail and just won't work for me. My projects sometimes won't always save on the iPads. And I've also learned some really good, really good stuff, like how to work Shobi, Book Creator, Explain Everything, and Instagram. And I've learned how to solve problems, and it's been really interesting for me. And I've learned a lot from my friends in class. And speaking of my friends, my friend from my team, Edie, is here to share one of her Genius Hour presentations. I think we have some help coming in, Ms. McCaster. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got a sixth grader. <laughs> My burning question that I start off with is what is 3D printing? 3D printing is pretty much what it sounds. It prints things in 3D. First, an object is locked or scanned into a computer, and then you can change stuff in the program, and then you send it to the printer, and it will print. Three different kinds of printers are the powder, the triple F, and the edible printer. The powder printer prints thing, anything that can be obtained as powder, and it a liquid is put into the powder and layered on top of each other to make the object. And it starts off in a programming program. And this was made in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And some powder printers can even print in color. The triple F printer, and it stands for fused filament fabrication. First, the object is either scanned or created on the computer, then it's sent to the printer, and it will get melted and layered on top of each other to make the object. It can print anything from toothbrush holders to an iPad case, and this is the most common 3D printer. It even is in some households, and it costs about $400. The edible printer is the same as the triple F printer. It is just a edible substance and it can create 
it can like um can ice cakes and can and can create sugar toppers and it can make gummy faces and chocolate faces and here's some pictures <laughs> and then the triple off printer the product is really terrible printer and then here are some of my sources that I really like to do and at the end of every presentation we asked if any of you guys had any questions so if you guys have any questions I have one for you have you ever physically seen a 3d printer Yes, I okay. went to a place in the mall, yes. and it's okay. called Virtual Craftsman, yep. and they printed it for me. I was going to say, if you had not, I was going to point you that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a, another friend from Northeast Middle School, Ethan Dawson. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ethan Dotson. I want to tell you a little bit about something I researched called egg coins. These are commonly used words or phrases that are mispronunciations or mixtures of real ones. The name was coined by Geoffrey Pullum, a professor of linguistics, after reading an article by Mark Liberman. The article discussed a case of a woman substituting egg corn for egg acorn and argued that this happening lacked a name. And Joffrey suggested using egg corn itself for, as a name for the air. Some examples of egg corns that I found are nuclear and centrifugal. Nuclear is a mispronunciation of the word nuclear, and centrifugal force is completely made up. <laughs> <laughs> the two forces it is used in place of are centripetal and centrifugal. This project was my favorite because I got to see how many words my family and I use every day are incorrect. <laughs> and I also saw a few unbelievable ones, such as hammer and thongs rather than hammer and tong. <laughs> when we were researching, we had to watch out for unreliable information in websites. And we learned to look for a legitimate author and to check if a possibly biased company created the website. If a company created it, there was probably false info to make their product more desirable. For example, a kid named CJ was set on getting an Alienware gaming laptop, and he decided to research whether or not he should really get one. The, Alien web, it, the Alienware website had only good things about the laptop, but when he interviewed someone at Best Buy, he learned that a desktop would be much better all around. Even though the school year and genius hour are concluded, I want to do more over the summer. I want to learn to use CAD with my dad and to learn more about creating art with 3D printers. I think genius hour is great. It's improved my technological skills on the iPads. It's helped my public speaking skills. But most of all, I think it's fun to get to choose what you learn about. We all feel very, really fortunate about that all 200 of us got to use the iPads, and it's been a great experience. We really hope that the kids next year can have the same experiences as us, and we thank you for the opportunity to present our work to the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we ask questions before you sit down? <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> do you always work as an individual or do you sometimes work in groups on these research projects? Well, it kind of depends. I've seen a lot. It's really common in my class to work as an individual, but I've seen like one or two projects made with two people. So you can do both. these projects you complete a whole project in one genius hour one week or do you stretch it over some time or how do you set um, that up you have a choice of how long you want to do it you do it until you think you're done with the presentation okay. and then you just keep doing it over and over do you present to your class or do you present to other individuals um, well in my class at least we usually just present it to our class like we'd create a powerpoint like you saw and we would present it to the whole class. I have one. 
Have you pointed out to your parents all the uh, acorns they use at home? <laughs> I actually have not. <laughs> <laughs> I will start doing that. Very wise. <laughs> Well, you were saying that you're going to miss this because next year you won't have this opportunity. Does it make you feel like you're going to do this at home on your own? I mean, does it get you excited to go explore different topics? Yeah, I think I'm going to do this a lot at home because it was a lot of fun and I got to share it with a lot of people, so it was pretty awesome. I would just say that just not only the knowledge, I'm very impressed with just your presentation for being in sixth grade. Yes. You, you should be congratulated just for, for all those skills as well. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Any more? Thank you for coming in. Great Excellent. Job. Good job. I think so. <laughs>
And so we started having some planning meetings. Um, one of the things we did is before school got out last year, we all went out to Logan's Roadhouse and had dinner. And <laughs> the folks that were interested in co-teaching, general ed teachers and the special education teachers, we sat down, we purchased some texts from Marilyn Friend. Uh, Dr. Friend is, is a, a national expert in co-teaching and um, has, has written a, a number of books. And so we, we shared a text amongst the group, um, but then also had an opportunity for teachers to meet with teachers, the general education teachers to meet with the special education teachers to kind of get to know them personally. We also had some pretty frank discussion about what's your style in teaching? What do you see out of this? And from that point, we had teachers then uh, kind of vote a little bit on who you might like to work with. And we created the co-teaching teams. We also, throughout the summer, made sure we had opportunities for teachers to work together, get to know each other, build and plan, and hope for success as we move along. Our vision ultimately is success for all students. We really thought with the co-teaching model that we would be able to meet the needs of various students, our special education students, our low social and economic students, as well as our gifted and talented students. Um, our vision from there, we were really intentional about setting up this program. The teachers volunteered, it wasn't an assignment. You volunteered to teach it, but then they also invested a great deal of time. We were intentional about, about making sure that we had a monthly collaborative, whether sometimes that would happen on our lunch hour, sometimes it would take a half day. But throughout the whole school year, we knew we needed to get together, we needed to talk with each other, find out how things were going, what were we frustrated by, what were they frustrated by, and just to reflect on it. We have common planning time for the fourth and the fifth grade so that they can meet with the special ed and the general ed teacher. Um, we're continuing our school improvement work. This is our very first year of doing this, but we're carefully watching how it's going. And you're gonna hear tonight what the teachers feel, what the students feel, and what the parents feel of how it's gone so far. But key to this all is really the reflective thinking. We need to reflect on how this year has gone and continue to move forward. And the teachers have done an excellent job at that. Next, we're going to talk about what co-teaching will look like specifically in the classrooms at Seaburg. Thank you. Well, what we have at Seaburg all of the classes are a little bit set up a little bit differently, but all of them have a collaborative um, student learning groups. Um, in the fourth grade, they have the students in groups of four. In fifth grade, in my classroom, I have a group um, in groups in three. And how I set up the room is the, the kids with, with three kids, you'd have the special education student would be in the middle, and then there'd be a regular education student on each side. Now, nobody knows who is what in the classroom, and it doesn't, it doesn't fit perfectly. There are some pods that only have general education students. And this is done on purpose that, so that nobody knows, there's no labeling involved in this. We are one classroom, which is one of the advantages of having a co-teaching classroom, is you no longer have the students leaving and being singled out. They're all members of the same class. Our class sizes are a little bit smaller. We have a few less students than the regular um, classrooms. And then with the co-teaching, communication is key. You have to let these parents know how this is very different from the resource room setting, where they, they were very used to walking, having their students go to a different room and getting just that special attention. And they were, a lot of the parents were nervous that they were now no longer going to be able to get the attention that they their students needed. And then in reality, they get even more attention because it's all grade level now. They are all surrounded with fifth grade work in our grade or fourth grade work in the fourth grade. And they are seeing not only the attention from both of us as teachers there, but the other students. And that's the biggest part of this, is having other students, their peers, treating them and working with them as equals. And it becomes a team in the classroom. And watching them grow as the year goes on um, is, is very, very big. And so when we communicate, email is the number one, along with newsletters, phone calls, and uh, and sometimes um, specific meetings after school with parents to make them feel comfortable with this new setting. Um, we do share responsibility with all of the students, so that means that the special education student uh, teacher does not just work with the special education students. It's mixed groups at all times. Once in a while, you'll have to pull a few students back to a table in the same classroom and work on with them towards their specific goals that they have, but in reality, that's, that's more rare. 
usually it's a mixture of special education students and regular education students that need that little extra help, whether it's with reading comprehension, with writing, with adding details, with getting a more clear message within um, the project or the assignment that you're doing. Uh, when we do the teaching, there are four main models that we try to use as much as possible. Peer teaching is we split the kids up in half. And I would be teaching half of the students, and Mr. Simons in our room would be teaching the other half. And again, this is a mixed group you have. Three or four special education students in each group and regular education students as well. And we teach the exact same lesson at the exact same time, which took a little getting used to because you have two voices going on. It's pretty hilarious when they're both reading. And it kind of feels like you have a little echo going on in the room. And the questions also then get uh, repeated on one side and the other, so they hear that. Sometimes it helps some of the students that they can hear the answer on one side of the room. And then when <laughs> our other group gets to it, they have a little bit of a, an advantage to that. Um, alternating lead teaching, basically, will be one of us will be up front while the other one walks around the classroom and helping out the students with making sure that they understand what they're required to do, helping them um, do the work and making sure that they're on task in case they're that's an issue for that side and that child. Um, station teaching is one that we really enjoyed. Um, what this one is, we used three stations. We had one independent learning station, and then the other two stations, Mrs. Simons was at one and I was at the other, and we would work on specific skills. We used it one of the times with writing, where I worked with the students on adjectives, Mrs. Simons worked with them on, I believe, similes, and then the other station was about dealing with editing their own papers. And then what the, that works is the students um, move from station to station while we stay in place and gets the kids up moving around a little bit and but then makes a very very smooth uh, lesson. And then finally um, teachers and facilitators we did this a lot through uh, book clubs this year and we encouraged the kids to come to class each day with their own questions that they wanted to discuss. Um, they would be in groups of four or five all reading the same chapter book and they would decide together how many pages they were going to read each night. They would bring discussion questions and we'd give them time each day to sit down as a group and just talk about the books. And, and then we would wander around making sure that they were asking appropriate questions, staying on task, and the kids absolutely loved this. And they always asked when we would be doing the next one because they get an opportunity to just talk about the reading. And we get the ability to listen to how they think and um, it was a win-win situation for sure. And then to show data is always a good thing to be able to back up whatever we're saying on this. So um, this is some of our um, just a snapshot of these eight students that are in um, Mrs. Simon's in my classroom. And all of these eight students during, um, during early testing of Dibbles were either um, strategic or intensive students. So they were going to be needing interventions. So these students would receive either a small group intervention each day or an individual um, intervention. And what we were very proud to say is that all eight of the students here exceeded the realistic goals for a year. And actually, seven out of the eight exceeded the um, thank you very much the ambitious goals for the year as well, which wow. I'm very proud of. <laughs> these kids have just done an amazing job, and the gains that we've heard. And what I really have enjoyed is when we have a, a sub in, and they come in, they are hearing the students read, they can't tell which the kids are labeled as special education, which the kids are regular education, because they all are just readers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, special ed and how well they have progressed. This is a sample of a writing student. I think one of the hardest things for a special ed teacher is to teach writing, because we can't really have a dialogue with the kid to help them understand, think through, give them ideas. We can give them ours. I think the best way is to do it with their peers. And this is, I think, phenomenal for the growth that they've made. What we call this is an Ames Web snapshot of a writing piece. We start out with the probe. Um, they think about it for a minute, and then they're timed for three minutes. This is a snapshot. The first one is at the very beginning of in fall. And if you were to look at the um, total words written, which is the TWW at the end, that was below the 10th percentile for a regular or a normal fifth grader. And then the CWS, which is the correct word sequence, which looks at vocabulization, punctuation, things like that. That was almost about the 25th percentile. The next one over there is the end of the year. 
Um, I'm real proud of this one because she exceeded way farther than I thought she would go. Um, she's almost to the 75th percentile. So to see somebody who couldn't write or couldn't write or had no idea to write and working with their peers, getting suggestions from their peers to come to that was just an amazing feat. And a lot of our kids went that way. So. And then this is a graph. This is a graph that we use with our kids, and you can see the pink line is the correct word sequence. Generally, the correct word sequence will go below the total words written, since they're not used to doing it, but she will go above towards the end. And you can see that she followed pretty much a very nice progressive and um, learning aim line. those math facts automatically. The blue on the chart is where they start at the beginning of the year. And this is our co-taught math class. So this includes general education students and our entire special ed caseload. Um, the red is where they ended up at the end of the year based on a pre and post assessment. Every single student made improvements, um, which I would love to say is as a result of our teaching only, but um, <laughs> that's not the case. The positive peer role models in the classroom really make a difference to the kids. They see their peers working hard, they see what their peers are able to accomplish, and they want to rise to that occasion. And they really put forth the effort to, um, to get where they need to be. And it's just amazing to see the progress that they've made just over the course of one year. These are just snapshots of data that we've looked at this year. We've, we've used the the ends with writing probes and also the math facts. But the reality is, as we move forward, we've got to see data that shows that it's a positive trend for kids being in this environment as it is just one option on the continuum. So we think about, as we move along, um, being reflective on what we're doing, what are the different data sources moving along that we're going to look at. We want to make sure the data that we pull is re purposeful, reliable, and valid data. Some of the things we're looking at we would like to use state assessments, but everybody knows that's in flux right now with the state not even knowing if we're going to be either smart or meep or, or smart or balanced. But other pieces that we're looking at is district assessment. Can we can we measure with that with the district assessment with the, over time how are kids progressing? How are our special education kids progressing comparative to resource room students' progression? Dibbles assessments and then interim assessments if that should come through smarter balance, those kinds of pieces. So we are looking at data sets to determine how much our kids growing and what the possibilities are for in the co taught environment. Just some pictures, got a pic uh, pictures of kids in the classroom, just kids in the classroom. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, parent survey that we gave at the end of the year. The teachers love the co-teaching um, that we've done this year. The students have gained so much and I mean there have been instances in the classroom that we have had tears in our eyes, tears of joy watching um, a special ed child teach a general ed student a, a math concept that the general ed student didn't get or the student that isn't the best reader in the class and the students know that but say hey come over and tell me about this picture of the snake this snake book that you have so we're very happy but we wanted to know what our parents thought this year um, since this is our first year so 86% um, of our parents reported that their child had a positive experience in the co-taught classroom again I think peer their peers kind, um, making them feel included, making it a team effort. 89% of parents reported that their child's experience was better or the same as compared to a traditional classroom. And the majority of parents reported that their child benefited academically and socially in a co-taught classroom. And we like to think that we're the teachers, but often it's their peers that can get through to them also. So again, we facilitate in that role. 
And these are some of the actual parent comments that uh, we took. Um, he liked not having to leave his classroom and miss out on what was being said in there. He felt more informed and missed fewer details. We have a lot of students um, that have organization problems and then going to the resource room and then having to come back and figure out, okay, where are we at? What are we doing? Um, they didn't have to do that this year, so we felt that um, organization did improve. Attitude was much better about learning. They seemed uh, happier in the classroom. Um, overall, I, I love my class this year and the joy and the smiles on all of the kids' faces, it, it's, it says so much. Um, another parent, I think the variety of styles of different teachers creates more interest in the classroom for the kids. I also think that co-teachers can feed off from one another, creating more energy in the classroom. Uh, my son improved more this year academically than in years past being pulled out for resource room. And I think when students feel included, um, it increases their confidence. Here are a couple more parent comments. My concern with the co-taught situation would be if the teacher allowed the at-risk students to dominate too much of the regular classroom instruction. The teacher, however, still managed to challenge the kids that need extensions. The teachers are an excellent model for how to manage co-teaching. And again, this year I was able to differentiate more than I probably ever had in the last 22 years that I've um, been a general ed teacher because I was able to work with mixed groups again, but we were also able to extend our high kids too, as well as um, the lower students who needed um, just a little extra help. Uh, the co-teacher helped my son with organizational skills, and I feel he got more individualized feedback on his writing than he did last year in a traditional class. And then the co-taught classroom allows for students to learn more at their own pace. Everyone learns at a different rate, and in this situation, allowed those that needed more time to receive it, and those that were ready could move forward. Again, being able to differentiate for all students. In addition to um, how we feel about co-teaching and how the parents felt, we thought it was important to get some feedback from the students themselves, because really, they're the ones we're trying to reach. Um, the first student, uh, one of his responses to our questions was, it helped me improve my behavior, having two teachers in the classroom. This particular student struggled quite a bit throughout the entire day, every day. Um, and having two teachers allowed one of us to take advantage, uh, whoever it may be, myself or in the classroom, it allowed us to take advantage of that moment right at that time, pull him and talk to him about what he did, what he could do differently, how to fix it, and then he was able to get right back in the classroom versus just having to be redirected and then going over it at the end of the day. It makes much more of an impact when you're able to pull them out right away so they can see the effects of their behavior. Um, another student said it's easier because I don't forget things when I leave the classroom. Those students who have trouble with organization, I mean, they're trying to remember okay, I'm going to the resource room now and I have to bring this, this, and this, but when I come back, I need these things which are somewhere in my desk. And by the time they've figured all that out, they're missed half the instruction. So being able to stay in the classroom just helps with organization and being able to stay on task. Half the, half the battle is being able to just hear the directions. Um, the next one, the teachers give step-by-step -step directions and it's easier to have two teachers than one. Um, and I learned more this year than last year. We have a lot of positive feedback from the students and it's wonderful to see that they actually um, got something out of what we were trying to work for this year. We have some cool pictures of us working as a team and um, that, so the alternating weeks. As we've reflected as teachers at our experience teaching together this past year. I know we all believe that what we have done has made a difference in the lives of our students. Um, we have observed significant student growth, both academically and socially. We've observed 
Club serves special education students rising higher in all core subject areas without having to miss instruction, directions, or content due to transitions to and from a resource room. Um, students have blossomed in skills, knowledge, and confidence. Um, students have benefited from the guidance and support of two teachers collaborating, planning, and observing together. We truly believe that this system has worked for the benefit of all. I like that uh, Lisa spoke from her heart. I've taught for 20 years here at MPS. And this is something I'm excited about. And yes, we're seeing academic gains and gains, and, and that is so important. But it's not always all that matters. We're seeing sparkles in kids' eyes that were kind of fading out. Um, we're seeing reluctant readers become avid readers. We've seen kids who hide in the back, who tune things out because they, they're not really engaged and not really buying into the desire to want to learn, start to become engaged and participate and raise their hands and have input and collaborate and feel a part of this community that we've created. And, and to me, that's exciting, that's joyful. Um, we have kids that have completely changed in their attitude towards learning kids that we couldn't get to, to stick with the book. They'd hold it, but they wouldn't necessarily be engaged with it. And we have these kids now who will say, is it reading time yet? Can we read? Um, we have one little boy who we have to progress monitor and do interventions with, and he wasn't loving it, but he's, he's come around and his confidence has blossomed. And now when we call him up to say, are you ready to read? This is his, his tone and his voice. Yes, I am. <laughs> he enjoys it, and he's proud. He shows off, and he's a benchmark reader at this point. Whether those will carry out in the future, I don't know, but at this point, I feel successful, not just because of data. I feel successful because these kids have changed over the course of this time, I believe. Um, things that we have mentioned earlier, the special education students have positive peer role models, um, which has helped to lessen the stigma of special education students. I truly don't think that the kids in my room know who special education is. We have kids being pulled for reading interventions. We have kids being pulled for behavior programs. Organization's a big deal. We have lots of kids on a checkout daily system. The cleaning crew, we call them. They have to clean and manage their, their materials and things before they leave. There are a lot of services that are coming out of this, um, this program that benefit all kids, not just special education students. Um, but special education students have gained confidence interacting and leading discussions within learning groups. And general education students gained empathy and compassion for all learners. I think they all realize they have some areas to develop, and they have become great partners, all students working together. I, I really do feel strongly that this is a success for all the reasons said before, and I think the excitement that we feel as, as teachers is a success as well. It makes us excited to, to see the progress and the, the things happening in our room, and so we thank you for allowing us this opportunity, all, that you, all of you that contributed to bringing it about, and um, we look forward to next year and years to come. Thank you. Before I go on to the looking ahead slide, I just want to say thank you to the Siebert team for doing this. Again, remember, these were volunteers who spent a lot of time in the summer reading books and articles, researching on their own, um, talking with each other, being risk takers. Um, this is probably, if this could be our professional development, I would say it's one of the best ones we've ever had. We've really learned a lot, and this team has come with a can-do attitude. It's not been always easy, but they've always stepped up and said, okay, how do we make and so that's what we're going to try to continue as we look ahead. Our goal, again, is to enhance and improve our team through our reflection and our work together. We're really excited, as I think you heard with some of the teachers, all of the teachers, to significantly impact students through higher quality instruction. How can we reach all of the students? That's the bottom line, and that's how this came out of school improvement. There were gaps. We were missing some students, and so this is our attempt to try to address those gaps and to help all students be successful. And we really want to see that growth over time. So with that, I just want to say thank you tonight. And if I can bring the team back out, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> I
try not to lead it, but I'm, I can't help it this time. You know, as, and you, you said it right, Susan, at the end, as we try to close the gap uh, with student achievement, and this is outstanding. Um, and I just applaud you for finding a way to do that and volunteering to do that and, and the professional development to get there. It's just outstanding. But a couple, couple I have two questions. One is you had 10 to 15 percent of parents that didn't speak favorably, you had the 85 to 90. Um, were those parents parents of the special ed kids or of the regular ed kids? Can you give me some flavor for what they were thinking and who they were? There were some of both. Okay. Um, there's some parents who may not have preferred or selected this if it had been an option for their student. Um, there's some parents who, especially in fifth grade, their students had experienced a resource room their whole school career for much of it. That's their comfort zone and that's where they were comfortable and what it was what they were used to. So I think it was a stretch for some of the parents and the students too. We obviously didn't get 100% on our survey. It's our very first year and again, we're reflecting on what we've done this year and how we can get better in the future. Okay. And then secondly, um, these kids move on to the next grade level. Uh, what happens next year with them? You'll have a new crop coming into you. The way, the way we've set this up is we're looking at fourth and fifth grade being totally included in Seabird Elementary. So we're looking at next year's third grade group moving into a co-taught model. The fifth grade will then transition to um, uh, this is Jefferson. <laughs> Jefferson, <laughs> and we have co-taught teams there. So it's, it's a perfect okay. transition for kids. Okay. The other thing too, it really gives us, when we do those transition meetings, transition IEPs, we don't have to explain co-teaching to, to parents. There's usually an, an anxiety with parents, fifth grade parents that may have had resource room, the transition to a co-taught co team at Jefferson. What's that gonna look like? They've already got a year of experience. They've already got a year of kids understanding, oh, I'm gonna stay in my classroom. Already has helped with skill building so kids are probably going to be more successful in that co taught environment. So we're really looking at, and when Susan and I talked about it and during the email that night or that day, uh, Saturday, you know, was looking at if we could just say, you know, K3 being the resource setting where we can pull kids out and be strategic and intensive with the, the instruction in the resource room and then lead into fourth and fifth grade being uh, included, that would probably be the best model. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Thank you. Sorry for monopolizing. Next. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, it's exciting to hear about the SPARC. You talked when you're through the SPARC, uh, students' interest and, and how much more learning goes on. And my guess is you're sparking not only special education kids as well as general education kids. I've seen it in the classrooms at, at Plymouth as well when there's inclusion. I think that's a great program. And I applaud your efforts because this is it's, a, it's exciting for Midland Public Schools. Um, but my question is, with kindergarten through third grade, would some kids get to get be included, or would all kids be put in a resource room, or how does that work? Well, we're going to push a little bit on that as well. So we, we've got a new teacher coming in next year, and we're really looking at opportunities to, to um, be a little bit more strategic, but um, trying to push it in third and second grade. Not a fully included, like fourth and fifth, but maybe their grading block times and things like that that we are gonna look for opportunities for the new teacher to come in and, and see if she can push in. Um, we can, you know, you also gotta look at schedules and, and with students and um, maybe not overload a third grade classroom without support throughout the day. The, the benefit for fourth and fifth grade is that we've had two teams. So we have two general education classrooms and a special education teacher that goes between the two. So you're able to divide students up a little bit so that, um, you know, with the Simons is, with Mr. Uh, you know, Andy, that, um, that, that that isn't totally overwhelmed with the group of kids there too. So we've got to look at that a little bit, but we are really thinking about are there ways we can push in at those lower grades, second and third, to give that opportunity. So it's a, a constant wheels in motion there. And the nice thing again is that that's not coming from Bob. Um, that came up over and over again in our spring data meetings and by the teachers. How can we get more of this? How can we have somebody push in at our levels? And so that is something that we're working on to expand. Good. Can you talk just a little bit more about how, um, about the benefits to higher achieving students? And Jerry talked about the 15% of student, or of parents who might not, you know, be really receptive to this. How do you sell them on it? Especially if they are parents of higher achieving kids who would like their kids to get more, you know, traditional education or whatever. I'll take that one. Okay. <laughs> um, well, 
start with uh, 15% on that. Um, you have to sell it to the parents, too, inviting them into the classroom and seeing what actually is going on. And the differentiation we can do with those higher achieving kids, they go above and beyond what they're able to do in my classroom. For example, my higher readers are reading seventh and eighth grade level books. They're not being held back trying to read at everybody's level. It's more like we're pulling everybody up. So sometimes you have to force the issue. And you, you must pull them along, and they will achieve. We have, I have a boy in my room that his parent was one of them that voiced some concerns on that. And we had multiple meetings with her. And as the year went on, she started seeing the benefits of this and how we could still meet his needs to be prepared for tests and social studies and science and how we can still offer him what he needs to be successful and to get that self-confidence in himself that he can do just like anybody else can in the class, that he's no different. And he went from a student that had never passed a general education test in science and social studies to getting some Bs on some of these tests. Or another boy that was in special education receiving A's on the tests and the amount of joy that he gets from that, that it's not a different test from everybody else. He's looking at the exact same test as everyone else. And as parents see that their special education students are now reaching such higher levels than they ever could before, but at the same time, these high achieving kids are going above and beyond too. They're still creating the projects and they're having the opportunity to do the research on what they want to be able to learn more information about. And they can create the PowerPoints and they can get onto the computers and do all of the things that they would um, be able to do otherwise. And they just also then can, the leadership that they get to have, that they can actually, we, we, we learn as educators that if you just talk to them, they will remember 10%. But once you start having them teach to others how much more of an understanding they have in that. And as the parents of the higher achieving students hear more and more from their kids as being the leaders of the classroom and going beyond what they could have ever done in a regular education or a general education, I'm using the wrong term, general education setting, um, I think they will come around as well because it's not a situation where we're trying to lower the bar to get everyone there. Instead, we're keeping the bar just as high for everybody and then raising it for the ones that need it to be raised. And I think from my personal, what I'm seeing in the classroom is these kids are reaching standards that they never would have reached before. I, the, my special education students are getting higher scores than they've ever had in my entire career in other areas besides reading and writing and the sciences and the social studies. And I'm excited to see what they do in the future. And I think the sky's the limit in this. This is something to buy into. This is something that as parents hear more and more about it and as they talk to each other, and that's what they do, parents talk to each other mm -hmm. outside of the schools and they start hearing more and more of the positives, our percentages will just go up. Have you had other elementary schools look at this to try to implement it? Like you're talking about collecting data and how you're trying to analyze. Are you to that point where you would uh, like to see it in other places, or are you still waiting I, I for I have some had other, other uh, teachers ask, special education teachers ask, and, and I had come back to, I didn't drive this. I didn't come to Siebert and say, Susan, you're, we're co-teaching. It was a school improvement-led initiative. That's the only way it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't have a group of folks that say, you know what, we're going to commit to this for two years, we're going to do our best, we're going to work, they're going to put the time in to make this work, it's not going to be successful. So that's what I keep coming back to, that when you're ready to, for me to come and talk to your school improvement team and you see value as a school, I, I will support you as much as I possibly can. Um, but it really has to be driven that way. If it comes from top down in a situation like this, we wouldn't have the success. And I hope you're, you know, as a special education teacher and our special, we, we you know, champion for our students with special needs. But to have general education teachers, when I've sat in our lunch meetings and collaborators and have these folks talk to the level they have about the achievements of students with uh, special needs in their classroom just is phenomenal for me. So it, it's got to be driven by the school. Did I answer your question there? Yeah. Okay. 
More just a comment. I would applaud each one of you just for your, your dedication to the students and, and, and even to yourselves. There was so much that you have learned doing this, it sounds like. I can feel your excitement just sitting over here and the grins on your faces. But ultimately, as one of you said, it's a win-win. And, and you can see that just not just academically, as you said, but just life skills. And, and I just think that's fantastic. And I hope we continue to be able to see it grow and blossom as, as we move forward. So thank you all. Thank you. Great example. So just a comment also is uh, I just think about how great this program has impacted the number of students there. And, and just you as a staff, how have you come together? But you look at the context in which things are in education right now and we know it's getting tougher it's getting a harder place to be in uh, I think you're an inspiration to your your colleagues but also the, the students and being innovative um, and we've seen other examples of buildings that have had presentations at board meetings that some of the best solutions for the district come from within and some of the best people that are here there's one example of it so thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our presentation is our general operating budget, and we'll turn it over to <laughs> Linda. Linda, will you be as good a presenter as the uh, sixth graders were? I like the idea of the little box. <laughs> 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 That's, That's where right. I was going next, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if I needed to be over there, I'd move the little box. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for this to come Just up in my zapper, but this presentation. while That's <laughs> happening, I would. This is the first look at the 2014-15 budget, and I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who had a hand in it. This is a truly monumental undertaking to pull together a budget for a district with revenues and expenses in the neighborhood of $80 million. And it is not my budget. It's not entirely my work. I work with a lot of very good staff. Uh, everyone at this table plays a role in it. And particularly helpful is the business office and Mrs. Lutz, the business manager. She really works with me as a team on this. And we both go into the document. She knows when I'm in meetings that she can be in there. And uh, we, just, we just go back and forth. And this couldn't be done without the work and the support of everyone else. I always like to start with the where are we picture. And we began discussion of the budget at the April 28th board workshop. Uh, tonight will be the proposed budget and the public hearing, and as part of that, we have to talk about the millage rate that it has to be levied in order to support this budget, and then you'll be asked to take action on it on June 23rd. And none of this is discretionary on our part. It's all called for by the Uniform Budgeting Act of the state of Michigan that requires that you have a balanced budget in place when the fiscal year begins on July 1. And as a reminder, a public school budget is not just an advisory document. It certainly serves in that role. But it is meant to be the closest accounting of the monies in and out of the district as we can make it. And so we are required, as the year progresses, to amend the budget. Uh, certainly, households don't do that. If you set a budget for yourself at the beginning of the year, you don't mid-year sit down and then have a family meeting and say, I think we need to amend our budget. Uh, but that is the way it does happen in a school district. And so at the June 23rd meeting, not only will you be taking action on approving your initial budget for 2014-15, you will be approving the final budget for 2013-14, seven days before the end of the year. But uh, that, that's one that we're now working on, now that this one is complete, to try to bring the accounting as close as possible to where we are. So let me begin with a rather substantial disclaimer. Uh, the 2014-15 state foundation allowance, which is the amount that we receive per pupil, has not yet been established by the legislature. There is talk that it could be done as early as the end of this week, uh, in which case this document will be out of date before it's ever been adopted. Uh, but we've done this before, and we just move forward knowing that it has to be amended at some point in the future. And the executive, that's the governor's budget, the House and the Senate versions, as we have seen them so far, all differ from one another. Uh, at last week's FFO meeting, we had quite a discussion about how it's best to approach this. Uh, the executive and the Senate versions handle the revenues and expenses in very different manners. 
But when you play it all out and get to the bottom line, it means the same thing for Midland Public Schools. It's just one puts more money at the, the revenue side, the other one reduces expenditures, it all balances out. But they are very different in substance. The House version is definitely the least favorable to the district, and if something close to the House version is adopted, it probably will uh, diminish our bottom line by about a million dollars based on what we were seeing earlier. So since there's no real clear direction at this time, we chose to use the executive proposal for this initial budget because of the three versions. It is the most similar to 1314, and so it allows for a, a little clearer comparison of the two years. It doesn't change the categoricals too much. It does have some increase in foundation, some change to the retirement rate. Uh, but if the final version is very different, we may need to amend our budget in the fall. And rather troubling to us is that today we received an email that said there's a little bit of a rumor that uh, they're looking at a $50 per pupil increase for districts such as Midland and a $125 per pupil for other districts, which exceeds the 2x formula that they've uh, used the last couple of years. This budget is built on the governor's recommendation of $83 for Midland and something higher for other districts. So if that one is adopted and there's not an improvement in other areas, perhaps some other categoricals or hold harmless money, that could have a pretty significant effect on the bottom line. Uh, but two looks at it here. This is a snapshot of the general fund, and I call it the best case because it uses uh, what we've seen as a historical variance on both the revenue side and the expense side, at least for 14-15. The 13-14 is based on the March budget, and at that point I felt that most of the variance on the revenue side was complete, and on the expense side, probably no more than an additional 2%. So that's used to calculate what the available fund balance will be going forward. And you can see that if uh, everything plays out the way it has historically, Revenues will be about $75.7 million. Expenditures about $77.3 million. Uh, with a shortfall, that would need to come out of fund balance of about 1.6%, leaving us about 8.4% of expenditures in fund balance. Now, that, that's what I would describe as the best case based on the governor's version. Uh, worst case assumes there is no variance doesn't assume that there's a negative variance, it just assumes that there is no variance and that we spend everything as it was initially budgeted. If that's the case, our expected revenues are just a tad below $75 million, expenditures just slightly over 80, and we will need $5.1 million out of fund balance, leaving us with less than 3 million or 3.7%. Now, along with the state budget uh, proposals are some legislative <coughs> bills that would require districts to notify the state long before going into true deficit status. And if we truly face this situation, it would be very likely that we would be thrown into that pool of districts that are considered highly at risk and we would have to do significant amounts of reporting to the state uh, to indicate how we are not going to drop in true deficit status. So it's another set of bills to be watching, but certainly a drop of fund balance from 10% to under four would trigger that because they're talking about anything for districts that uh, drop five percentage points of their fund balance or more or drop below five along with declining enrollment and, and some other issues. Now the formal document that you had in your packet was a mix. It wasn't the best case, it wasn't the worst case, it was about halfway in between. And most of the remaining slides are based on that document as well. So it showed uh, not quite as much variance as the best case, uh, but a little bit more variance than, than the worst case. And it's more con traditional, it's, it's what we've looked at in the past. This is what the history of the fund balance has looked like over the years. 
uh, going back to 2008-2009. I like to use 08-09 as a base year because that was our year of highest per pupil funding. Our per pupil foundation allowance was $8,904 per pupil. That's the highest it's been in the history of the district. And it was after that that we lost the 20J funding and the $470 per pupil. And we've been just very slowly crawling out of a hole since that time. Uh, so in 2008-2009, you can see that revenues and expenditures were pretty well matched. Uh, in 9-10, we overspent very slightly. And that was a deliberate choice. The, the budget was adopted that way. 10-11 was a very favorable year for us. And we came in under budget, and we were able to put a little bit into fund balance. And that has really helped in the last couple of years that we had that good year. Because you can see every year since then, we have been taking more and more out of fund balance. And our, the, the gap. As you can see for this, this current year is larger than it was last year, which was larger than the year before. And this is despite cutting millions and millions and millions of dollars out of our budgets over the last decade. Uh, another picture just of the fund balance. You can see, that, now this goes back to the uh, beginning of Proposal A when we first moved to per pupil funding and we're no longer reliant purely on our own local tax base. And you can see we've gone up, we've gone down. A uh, high point was about 03. And again, that was a deliberate choice on the part of boards because at that point we were facing three very, very significant appeals of taxable value that had the potential and did cost us many, many millions of dollars of interest once those appeals were settled. And in fact, you can begin to see where they were settled, a huge drop from the 07 to the 08 fiscal year. And that represented one of the larger settlements right there. Uh, so the boards specifically set some funding targets to put money in the fund balance so that we would be able to address that when it came. But uh, unfortunately, I don't like the slope on the last <laughs> five uh, bars there, it, it's far too consistent. And I'd like to see a little bit more up and down there and definitely more up. Because we are at the point where if the fund balance truly drops down below $5 million, we may be in a position where we need to borrow money in the September time frame between before the taxes come in and before that October state aid payment, late September, early October could be a problem for us because having some fund balance doesn't present, present, uh, prevent borrowing. You need a pretty sizable fund balance in order to do that just because of the, the up and down nature of the cash flow. So here's the assumptions that went into building the 2014-15 budget. Uh, enrollment, working with Stan Fred Consultants, is down 149 in the blended count pretty close to the difference between incoming kindergarten and outgoing senior class. Uh, because we used the governor's executive proposal, we did include an $83 foundation increase, a $13.26 per pupil hold harmless categorical. The way uh, his proposal was that it would be the same amount we received this year. And this year, that's the amount that we've received. And it was to guarantee that after they eliminated one of the categoricals last year, we actually would still have a net foundation increase. So for us, uh, it was $13.26. Uh, we continue to qualify for the performance incentive. And this is for mathematics performance in grades three through eight on last year's MEEP. Uh, they've already published the table saying that we qualify for that. Now, some of the versions of the budget eliminate that as do some versions eliminate the per pupil funding for best practices. Or one of the versions created so many best practices that will be so difficult for districts to reach that if that version is adopted, we would have to take that money out because we probably couldn't qualify. So they really go back two years to 
reward you for, for yes. the performance. Yeah. Yes. And they, Interesting. Uh, they also reward for <laughs> reading. Yeah, so there's absolutely nothing you could do today. It's unlike the best practices mm -hmm. where you might be able to take some right. action to qualify. No. And the reading, uh, similar calculation. We don't qualify in the reading. The high school calculation is the most convoluted formula I think we've ever seen. Mr. Cooper and I looked into it. We talked to the person who handles it at the state. There is nothing that we can do at the local district to forecast or predict whether we would ever qualify for the high school money. So when I put that up there, it's because the state has published a table that shows what districts would qualify mm -hmm. for what. Uh, but at the high school level, it, it's all based on slopes and standard deviations at the state level that are not published numbers. Uh, we have no idea of figuring out where we even are relative to that, whether we're close or whether we're far away. But we do know it's in print that we qualify for the performance incentive for math, for 12-13. Uh, and then the governor eliminated the MIPSERS, that's the Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System, cost offset categorical, but did change the employer cap rate and reduced it. So that's also reflected, it, that's not, well, it's both a revenue assumption and an expenditure assumption because I used that rate in calculating what the expenses would be. So here's what enrollment looks like. And the last time uh, before I pulled this table together and actually looked in our data system to see where registrations were, it looked like we were on target to hit these numbers. You, you can see small drop at elementary. Elementary has just about stabilized. You can see what a drop has occurred from the 08-09 year to 14-15. And you can also see how that drop has almost flattened. Uh, it's now affecting the secondary. Again, a drop of over 100 at the secondary and some slight reduction in special education numbers and some of that probably is a reflection of just the reduced overall enrollment. And what we noticed this year is that we didn't have any drop at all of any significance uh, from s October to February. And so our blended count ended up being what our actual fall, you know, what our fall count was because the blended count is now 90% of October, 10% of the following October, or of the following February. So with that, I just carried forward what the anticipated en enrollment was. And the change going back to 8-9 is almost a 15% reduction in enrollment, which then compounds the loss of revenue because not only did we actually lose per pupil revenue, but we lost pupils. And that's what the pupil graph looks like. Uh, this one, again, goes back to the beginning of Proposal A time period when the per pupil funding came into place. And the high point for the district was 96.76, about a decade ago. I will say that right around that time, we made a change in how some of the students in the ETC, the alternative program, were being counted. And they came out of the count. We didn't actually have fewer students countywide, but they were taken out of our count and, and placed elsewhere. But from that point forward, it does truly reflect the declining enrollment for the district. Uh, and very similar picture. If I were to increase those uh, by about a million, you would have the state picture and it would look almost exactly like ours. That's the, the nature of where, where we are. So here's our, the sources of our per pupil funding. Uh, using the governor's proposal, I would expect that the foundation allowance for resident pupils next year will be $8,254. Of that, $415.31 comes from our hold harmless millage. Uh, then $2,406.56 comes from the non-homestead millage, that's the 18 mills or the six mills on commercial property. 
So a little more than a third, 34.2% of our funding is raised locally, uh, leaving the state's share of that at about $5,432.13. And you can see that over time, the state's share has dropped from 73.3% down to 65.8%. Part of that is the result of the loss of the 20J funding. Part of that is the result of just overall reduced funding. And then part of that is the state share drops as local property tax values increase. And Linda, thank you for making that point. I'd, I'd like to make that to the public here. So if tomorrow property values in Midland doubled <laughs> and your <laughs> local taxes that you are paying doubled, it doesn't mean our revenue goes up the state just turns down the knob exactly. on Maywa contribute to a fixed mm -hmm. number. So it, it's it's irrelevant to some degree where it comes mm -hmm. from to MPS. It's, yeah. uh, it, if, we're, if our taxpayers donate nicely, mm -hmm. the state donates equally less nicely. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a dial that only turns one way. Yes, <laughs> because exactly. Because <laughs> if our taxpayers <laughs> should decide not to renew the hold harmless and the non-homestead millages, which are up for renewal next year, all of this goes away. The state does not increase its share. It just says, oh well, <laughs> figure it out. Too bad. Uh, you know, here's what you should be getting, and here's what we calculate you should be collecting, and whether you collect it or not is not our problem. This is what our share is that we owe you. And make a point that this is just the general, the six mills. This isn't what we just voted on. You know, that is yeah, extra. Yeah, it's not the correct. Yeah, yeah, so that people correct. don't think that they just voted for no, something no. that no, is correct. not that really is, that is extra. Yes, so. No, and in fact, this is probably a, a good time to do a quick segue into the tax rate, since that's going to be part of the uh, hearing. And the, the tax rates that this is based on Assume that the hold harmless amount will be 1.7399 mills, and there's a convoluted set of calculations that create that number, but based on taxable values as we know them today, that's what it will be. Uh, and that this number, the non-homestead, is made up of six mills on commercial personal property and 18 mills on non-homestead. And, and those are all approved amounts at this point, but they are up for renewal next year. Hey, Linda, this is an esoteric point, but I just caught my curiosity. Is there anybody in the state whose local millages are greater than the foundation allowance? Yes, there are. That's not an esoteric point. There are still a handful of districts that are considered to be out of formula uh, many of them were capped at an amount lower than 18 mils back in 1994, but as long as that capped amount raises at least the foundation, they are able to collect what that is. The two that I know of for certain are Northport and Glen Lake. Those are both out of formula districts. They get no state aid payment. Uh, they rely entirely on their local millage. Now, they're not able to raise that millage, but it raises more per pupil than, than the state what their state allowed amount would be. So there is, I think there's probably fewer than a dozen districts in, in that boat, but there are still a few. We used to be one of those prior to Proposal A. Uh, other thing that I want you to, to note here is that when we had the 20J payment, you were able to add the hold harmless, the local, and the state, and you would get the foundation. And the 20J was a kicker. That doesn't work anymore. If you add this plus this plus this, you're not going to get. Hmm those. Uh, the, the local hold harmless no longer provides a full 415 above the state amount, somewhat less. Okay, here's the story of our foundation allowance. And this is 
both the MPS and the state minimum. Earlier I said that we're hearing that this year uh, MPS foundation may go up 50 and the state could go up 125. Well, here you can see what that has looked like on a percentage basis. Uh, so you can see early days of uh, Proposal A, uh, we were getting at least a 2% increase. And because it, it tended to be a similar dollar amount, those districts with a lower foundation were seeing a higher percentage. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we came into these years where you quite a bit more and in two, three, four, this area, none of the foundations were fully funded. There was an amount that we expected at the beginning of the year and then mid-year something called a proration occurred and the amount was reduced. Uh, and then in this year where there's a loss for MPS but not for anybody else, that was the year that uh, Governor Granholm vetoed 20J. And then this year, all districts took a $470 cut because our cut was on a larger foundation. It was a smaller percentage mm -hmm. for us, but in sheer dollars that represented the same. And then you can see the last uh, couple of years, the 2X or for us, the half X formula uh, has, has played out. And here's what it looks like relative to CPI and over this time period, and this is about a decade, our foundation is actually seven tenths of a percentage point lower than it was a decade ago, whereas CPI is 25.7% higher, which Killer. explains why we've had the difficulty despite cutting tens of millions of dollars getting a balanced budget. And Linda, that doesn't include the, don't I want to go there, the retirement <laughs> It doesn't additions. include any increase in any That would cost. make that, if you right. put it all in the That's same terms, it would make it yeah. even a lot worse. Right. And, whoops, I make this graph every year just to depress myself. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, and it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> this, this takes our very first post-proposal A foundation, $6,915. And just shows what it would be if it had followed traditional inflation. It would now today be somewhat over $11,000. Instead, it's down here. You can see it's lower than it was all the way back to about the 0102 time frame. Had it kept pace with inflation, we would have $21 million more wow. in the budget at the current enrollment. So even with loss of enrollment, we'd have $21 million more. Pretty significant. All right, shifting into the details of the budget. Here's what that almost $75 million worth of revenue looks like. 63% from the state, uh, about 26% from our local property tax a small slice, not even 2% from federal. Other local revenue includes escape proceeds, pay to participate, cell tower leasing, um, some Medicaid money that flowed through the ESA. Transfers includes the enhancement millage, that's over $3 million. And it also includes the other monies that come from the ESA, the Act 18 special education millage. And, and any transfers refer to monies that either come from other governments or from other funds with an MPS. And our one interfund transfer that we have is we are permitted to transfer a small amount from food service in to cover some of the general fund costs. And I believe that number is about $5,000. So most of those transfers are, are coming from the ESA. And the largest share of those would be the enhancement millage. Okay, talk a little bit more about the expenditures. And these are personnel related expenditure assumptions. We'll go into some of the, the other areas a little bit later. Uh, the largest change is that the MTA salary has been reduced by 2%, and that's because the contract contains a formula that provides for an adjustment ranging from negative 2 to plus 1%, pending the outcome of the audit. 
and I've been doing preliminary estimates based on adopted budgets along the way, and it looks as if there will be a full 2% reduction on the scale. Calculation is actually something higher than that, or greater than negative 2%. Uh, so I think it will reach that, that capped amount, but we won't know for sure until probably August or September. Uh, for any employee groups that have them, there are steps and merit increases that are built in. There are no other wage scale adjustments, and Mr. Shero will be going over the salary letter uh, following this. Teaching FTE is reduced by a total of 12.4. Most of that happened through attrition. Very, very, or voluntary reductions. We had teachers requesting reductions in contract. Uh, I think it, it came down to just the tiniest potential reduction. And quite honestly, it could be very different by the time we get to fall. So uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, virtually no layoffs this year. Uh, then on the administrative side, we had the vacant positions of coordinators of mathematics and science that we had filled with teacher consultants this year. Uh, we eliminated those through a reorganization of the curriculum division. We also eliminated for the upcoming year the East Lawn assistant principal and the Midland High School mathematics department head. Uh, we had throughout this year, we had some changes in office professionals and administrative assistants. For next year, we have two office professionals who are being reclassified as managers. It better reflects what it is that they do. Uh, but we also had two manager positions that were combined with other roles and were not filled when they were vacated. So we eliminated those, but did some re-leveling of what's remaining. So if you look at the chart in the salary letter, and you'll see some pluses and minuses in all those areas. These are the details behind them. Uh, we also have a building manager who's retiring, and so we are going to contract through our new custodial services contractor, see how that works for us. So it takes someone out of the, or the managerial FTE, but moves them into the category of a contracted service. Uh, and then for all health-related benefits, there was a 9.4 percentage increase, there, actually there is in the budget, and after the budget was all done, we received the dental quote for next year, and it's actually dropping. And so the increase, if I were to redo the budget today, would be something between, I believe, 7 and 8%. So That big. It's a big change. Well, it dropped, and I had built in the increase mm -hmm. from the previous year. And mm -hmm. dental, it, total dental costs for the district are, are in excess of half a million dollars. Hmm. So they're their share of the health benefits. They're number two right behind medical. Mm. So on the staffing side, this is what it looks like. Uh, we look at a ratio of students per administrator, per certificated staff. Certificated staff are those staff who hold valid teaching certificates, typically teachers and administrators. Uh, on the teaching side, the number increased from 16.9 to 16.7. And you can see the administrative side went up a little bit larger. And it doesn't fit the scale of this chart, but I played around with looking at the numbers because now that teachers must be evaluated every year, an important metric is beginning to be how many teachers per administrator. And that number has grown significantly. Um, but it doesn't fit either one of these scales, and so I, I left that one off, but that's something to consider in the future. Uh, it, it, that is something that's gone up. Um, let's see, oh, I do have my dental number, 8.9%. And the uh, teaching relatively flat there. The teacher to administrator ratio has gone from 12.1 to 13.7. All right, more expenditure assumptions. Overall in the budget, it's 2.9% smaller than the current adopted 13-14 budget. There was a 2.1% reduction in the personnel-related costs. Those are wages and benefits. 
That represents 85.2% of the budget. Non-personnel costs, we were able to reduce more, 7.3%, but unfortunately that's less than 15% of the budget, so it doesn't represent as many dollars. Uh, every department was charged with reducing its budget by 5%, which they did. Our new custodial contract will save us 11% in the cost of that contract. Uh, we did have a 6.9% increase in our special education tuition that we will pay to the ESA, but that is offset by an increase on the revenue side. So bottom line, uh, we're actually a little better off next year than we are this year. A little more revenue relative to the increased expense, but we still owe more than we're getting back. But the uh, increase in revenue was about 73,000. It's what they estimate for us next year. And here's what it looks like if we go area by area. You can see in salaries and wages, we've reduced 1.7 million. Some of that is actual reduced wages, that 2% for the teachers. Some of it is reduced FTE. We're paying fewer people, and some of those people we will be paying fewer dollars than we did this year. Uh, benefits increased, and I should tell you that a very large component of this number, al almost 10% of that number, is a payment that goes directly to MIPSERS that is offset by an identical amount of revenue. And so uh, if you look through the details, you'll see a particular line item of 2.2 some million dollars that amount had to be spread throughout all the expense accounts as well. So it doesn't reflect the current retirement costs. It, it's, a, it's a way that the, the state is dealing with the unfunded liability. So the fact that we had to spread that amount of money in there and our overall benefits, our medical costs were up about 9% and we only had that, that increase pretty good, although had that not happened, these should go down relative to salary. Uh, and then the other areas, you can see most of the reductions. And let me explain this one, the other, which is leases and gifts. The way that we handle budgeting for gifts is at the beginning of the year, we put in a line item for $200,000. Every board meeting, when you approve those lengthy line items of gifts, Mrs. Laux takes that 200000 out of that account and she moves the expense into wherever it was intended to go. So if it were classroom wish list items at Woodcrest, it gets moved up into probably here, supplies and materials. So this number is higher than the relative March number because I took the gifts back up to their 200000 that, That's the only reason that that number increased. Uh, and then the outgoing transfers, that's where we pay the ESA, that special education tuition. So that, that's in there as well. But other than that, I'd say everybody did a pretty good job of reducing their expenses. Uh, and then this is what it looks like by function, 65% for classroom instruction, another 5.5% for student support. 5.9% instructional support. And the difference is student support are those services that go directly to students. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, social work, psychologists. Uh, instructional support will be uh, technology and some of the special services. Uh, I think you saw Mr. Paris here. He's considered instructional support. The curriculum division, all of that supporting the teachers in the, the classrooms. And then you can see central office represents 1.1%, building administration 5.6%, support services, uh, that would be HR and non-instructional technology are the, the biggest components there. And then you can see maintenance, transportation, everything else adds up to 12.9%. And then the other way we look at it is always by account and salaries, about 55.6%, FICA 4.2, retirement because of that big chunk that we 
receive the revenue and then has to pay it back is now 16.3% of the entire budget. Medical, 7.4, the other benefits, 1.7, and then everything else, purchase services, repairs, supplies, utilities are over in this category, uh, capital outlay, any technology purchases, technology licensing, everything is in there. And again, the outgoing transfers, that would be where we pay the special education um, tuition. So other than the fact that we don't know what the actual per pupil amount is going to be and we don't know what the State Aid Act is going to say, the other area that always is a source of variance and a source of concern is our medical cost because it is volatile. We are self-insured, so there is not a set premium although that has worked well for us. We're not interested in having a set premium, but it does create some variability. And you can see in this current year, this is one of our higher years in total. The, the blue bar is the medical and the brown bar is the pharmacy. And so combined, we get a per member per month cost. And this is, right now we're on target for about our third highest cost over since the time that we've been self-funded. But you can see there, you, there's no rhyme or reason. You may have a high year and then you may have a low year. That's just the randomness of illness. Uh, so I can't forecast and say, well, because this year was high, next year will be even higher. Next year could be significantly lower. But I use this figure for where we are right now to okay. forecast where we would be using the trends for medical and pharmacy for next year. So we're starting from a little higher platform and that generates a higher amount, uh, which there, there's good and bad there. It, it could mean that we have larger expenses next year, but it also means that if we have a good year, there's more that will come out of the budget at the end of the year. So that's, that's your little cushion. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And just to be clear, and I, th I think I hear it, but just to for, since we talked about the dental, the assumptions in this budget pass are the 9.4 percent, yes, not inclusive of the new dental findings. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that that made this picture that that would be part of the budget and variability. Yes, that we're talking and that was about, about a $500,000 yeah. delta. Um, you said well, dental itself is about 500,000. Yep. And so it's probably about a 50, 60,000. Well, it might have been a $75,000 swing okay. between forecasting an increase and the actual decrease ah, that took place. Okay. So presented for information this evening, and we'll ask for your approval at next week. The next meeting. And at this time, I ask for a public hearing on said budget that we did at the workshop and heard in a subsequent meeting. And tonight, uh, this I'll open the public hearing at this point in time, does anyone wish to speak to the budget? And Mark, I think you know the drill. Yep. <laughs> Hello. 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 On now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Hi, Mark Marinan, 21 West St. Andrews. Uh, these folks have a tough road to hoe, so uh, it's not, not a pretty picture. I guess four th things real quickly. Uh, one is it'd be nice to see a budget that did make that slope change a little bit. Um, I think it probably would also be a, a good service to the public if you came up with a budget that said if we had to keep our cash balance flat, Here's what we would do and give people some idea of, of what's coming down the road because it's coming very fast. Uh, third one is, I suspect they're already doing it, but it would be interesting to know what's going on with our elected representatives and lobbying efforts to try to change the picture that we're seeing. And I guess the fourth one, it's it's that's tough. Um, I don't like to see you know, the teachers getting a 2% pay cut. That's, that's no fun at all. I have no idea how good their 403B plan is, but is there anything that can be done to give them you know, lower lower fees in their 403B plans or you know, anything at all to ameliorate this thing? So, good luck. 
Thank you. Thank you. We'll take all the luck we can get. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, give me a comment. Oh, well, one of the things I think, uh, what's coming down the road, I mean, Linda's slides show that pretty well. 85% is, is salary and wages. Um, we've cut the other 15, 85% has grown, partly because of retirement costs going up, medical costs, but it's also because we've cut all the other areas to nothing. And so it, there's not a whole lot of areas left to go besides salary and wages. And so, I mean, that's to make it as clear as it can be. Um, and to build a budget that reflects that is nearly impossible because we have to negotiate all that yet to come. And so really don't know what that outcome is going to be when we get there. So it, it, school finance is what it is. It's a messy picture as we go forward. It, Mike, that's a great comment for Mark particularly. And the other one I would add is Linda touched it and we've harped on it before, but since Mark commented, um, what we have to pay for retirement is ungodly. And all it does is tell you how underfunded the pension fund is. Um, you know, we're paying 16% of every dollar in payroll for retirement, paying 9% on medical. Uh, it's more than 16. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 25%. Yeah, 28, yeah, yeah, yeah 25%. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was 60 the percent of the budget. budget, not not the percent of, budget. of 25% the percent of the yeah. 25, 26, isn't it? Somewhere mm -hmm. of payroll. And remember, the state, retirement. the state owns that. We have no control. Over yeah, no control. So, so really the state's debt that they pass it, to us. It's been fun when we see increases, the small increases you've seen in the um, uh, foundation have gotten largely offset, if not entirely offset some years by our increases in pension payments. So it's a little interesting way it's presented <laughs> to, the, to the public. Okay, any other? comments from the public with our other two publics sitting here <laughs> <laughs> see none uh, I'll close the hearing I can just do that unilaterally correct mm -hmm. budget hearing is now closed and now I'll hand it over to Mike for the salary adjustments for employee groups salary letter so it has been your past practice you have the salary letter in front of you in your package and it shows no increases across the board except for as Linda mentioned those step increases of those that have earned and without going in greater detail you've been through that a million times and so it is there presented and you've had a chance to look at it a draft version a couple weeks ago and uh, the final version now and i'd encourage the public at one under wants to understand where things are going from a pay and benefits perspective it's a great way of seeing everything online now if you want to stop down and see it and i don't know if it's on the website or not but uh you feel free to stop down. It really is a nice chart and it shows that. So. Yeah. Okay. Back to you. The off reduction, um, we have a point two position. And I've been struggling with the words all day because I don't want to say only when it's somebody being reduced point two, but um, the I can't remember what Linda show. You need action. You need action. I, I thought maybe that was the case. Maybe oh, in the salary it. letter? Yes. Take a motion mm -hmm. to accept the salary letter as, pre as presented in our package. Anybody? I move we accept the salary letter as presented in the package. Support. Support. We have a move, movement of support. Any discussion or questions? Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye, Sally. So, point two reduction in front of you. We are really um, with great benefit of the number of teachers retiring and leaving the system. It allowed us to reduce, um, why, why am I not drawing that number, Lenny? You got off your head, 12, 14 teachers total. We 12 reduced 12.4 uh, teachers that we reduced total, and 0.2 is the layoff reduction. So thank you to many of those who are retiring, despite that we missed, that it saves some people those, those jobs as well. So we also need that need to approve. Yeah, need a motion on that also to approve that reduction. Is there a resolution? Um, it is. We, Mike, do you want to talk about resolution in that regard? Cindy whispered in my ear beforehand. No, there's no need to have a resolution. You have done that in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen that done anywhere else, and there's no, no legal reason for you to do that. You're taking action, and, and, that, and it's part of your minutes of who that person is being laid off and, and where that reduction is being done. That answers your question. There's no need to read a resolution. I, I think it came in our packet as a resolution, and we're just used to that, so that's 
Okay. You can if you would like, but there's, there's no need. I think is how it's going to function. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to move uh, approval agenda item 4.8, um, layoff reduction of uh, teaching staff for 2014-15. Any support? Support. Support. Any discussion or more further questions? I, I just want to echo what Mr. Sharo was saying is that we're, we've seen these things over the, the years and that I'm just thankful that it's as small as it is, but even though it is a, a portion of a person's time, it is um, very difficult to do and it does affect people. And we know we do as a board does have effect on people and their careers and their families. And um, I'm just glad it's not a much larger number. And certainly not to say it's could be reversed or something could happen, but a lot of time water's gonna flow under bridge between now and September in terms of other people maybe leaving and things of that nature that we've that seen historically too that things three months is a long time. So that yeah, could change. It's hard because this is a, just an excellent, excellent teacher. Yep. So um I have a question, uh just a generic question. With the um with the requirements of specific skills now required for specific teaching roles, and as we shrink in size in terms of staff, et cetera, are you finding or anticipating difficulties going forward of having highly qualified staff and being able to position things with layoffs versus what's needed with the requirements of certain teachers in certain positions? Do you see that as a pending issue at all? Well, uh, I'm not sure exactly your question, but math and science are usually yes. our yeah. hardest areas to fill. Uh, I, I think special ed's kind of become less of a problem through the years in personnel. And Gary's really not here. That's his area of expertise. But, no, I really don't anticipate that okay. still. And it's not like your, any of your buildings are going to be. It's high schools certifications are the ones that usually cause you problems mm -hmm. and the number of preps the teacher can teach. But your high schools are still going to be large enough, you know, have that critical mass. And so we're kind of a much smaller district where it, and sometimes it does get difficult, but you make it work. Okay. Yeah, I just thought of one other question is that um, is there supports in there for staff to get additional certifications so that they can maybe as the need for maybe their certification in a particular area, can they cross train or go into other areas? Are there are opportunities like that out there? There's always opportunity for them to take that up if they would oh, like to. Additional education yeah. and okay. And the key is having the foresight to know things could happen in the future based on where you're at. Well, and I think there's some that already do that. Have done that, I mean, exactly. They're, they're, yeah. Yep. Okay, any other questions? If none, I'll take a vote on that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, superintendent contract review is the next thing on the agenda. Um, I'd remind everyone, all the board members, that uh, last December we did Mike's I'll call it formal, former performance review. Um, uh, in that, you're supposed to include student achievement, but Mike hadn't been here for an academic year to base that upon. Uh, state law requires that. Um, we gave him a preliminary evaluation that was very good. And his first contract year is now uh, coming to a close here on June 30th. And it, historically, not by law, but historically, we have always tied performance to contract provisions. And so reflecting back on um, the fact that we've now one year gone on the contract and Mike's performance that we highlight in December, um, I want to bring to the board the notion and, and has been expressed to me by a variety of board members to extend Mike's contract after the first year as has been the history in Minimum Public Schools. And I would just highlight at first several of the major accomplishments we've seen from Mike and I'm going to be shortcut the list here quite a bit. Uh, very quickly when he came on board, he met with 60 community leaders right away. He's met with every member of building staffs. He's had uh, 50 non, -M he's attended 50 non-PUP MPS community events since he's been here. And while he doesn't wave flags when he goes to MPS events, he's been to many, many, uh, and many more than that MPS events. He's joined over half a dozen community uh, uh, leadership organizations. He led the re successful renewal of our countywide enhancement millage here a few months ago. He's created relationships with the foundations day one when he got here, resulting in the completion of the PYP grants we got for I PYP IB. Uh, he has created and executed a successful transition plan for the folks sitting right there at the table. 
and uh, was key to us with the top leadership of the district. Um, he's also created and starting in the starting phases of a possible IB preschool program uh, that has exciting things for us going forward. It was a very creative idea. And quick initiation of uh, a long-term facility evaluation and plan as we're going forward. And those are just a few comments I had. With that, and uh, some of your comments on extending Mike's contract, um, I will be pleased to accept a motion from many of you to extend Mr. Sherrill's existing employment contract with Midland Public Schools from today's tr uh, term of June 30th, 2016 to a June 30th of 2019 uh, termination. Uh, and that would all be effective July 1st of uh, this year. Uh, for abundance of clarity, all the other contractual terms such as compensation, benefits, duties, et cetera, remain unchanged uh, from the current contract. Uh, this effectively makes Mr. Sherrill's contract with MPS a five-year contract, effective July 1st of 2014, which has been the history of MPS. And I uh, personally feel Mr. Sherrill's performance in our first year more than warrants our confidence in doing that with him. So at this point, I'd entertain such a motion from one of you in a second, and we can have a discussion from there. I'd be glad to motion and support that. Um, motion to extend Mr. Shero's contract for five years till 2019. Do I have a second? I'll support, support. it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you should do it. Okay, we have motion and, a, and support. Um, I'll open it for discussion. Where do we want to start? Lynn, I'll, I'll start with you. I'm happy to support that. I think Mike has uh, proven what an effective leader he is and, and very innovative. And I know when we um, had discussion and we were looking to hire a superintendent, that was a big um, factor is Mike's innovation and um, creativity when it comes to all kinds of areas of uh, being the superintendent of the schools. And I think MPS is very fortunate to have his leadership. Anybody else? I appreciate the uh, communication across the board. I think uh, it's wonderful to get out to the community and share what what's going on at MPS, and I, I see that as a huge benefit as well as your leadership and your um, your vision for the future and uh, doing more with less is what we're forced to do, and we need to be creative. And I think we've got a staff all around us that that supports that as well, and uh, I'm very comfortable to have you at the helm. And I appreciate your enthusiasm for facing that challenge. I think that came through in your interview, and I still see that, and I really appreciate that a lot. I think that affects us all real well. I mean, it makes it seem better. <laughs> John, you had your hand up? Yeah, you know, a lot of things have happened in a year, but I know Mr. Charles, he's very patiently and, and quietly working to get the district prepared for where we need to go. and. Um, does take time, and, and I, I think you're going to do that very well. Um, it's just a question of can we change fast enough? And I think that you've been a realist, and um, I, I think that you're definitely up to the task. But a lot more to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo John's on that you're a realist, and I really appreciate that. And you seem like you've come in and you've really assessed, and then you're moving forward. You're not, you don't wait, you actually take action. and, and several different fronts and I really appreciate that and um, I mean, this is a big decision for us when we had to hire a new superintendent and they say that's the most important thing that a board does and I've been so pleased this last year and that we made the right choice. Scott's not here tonight but he did send me something he like read into, into the record so I will do that. Uh, Mike I'm sorry I could not attend the meeting tonight or I feel it's important to express to you and the public at large some of my thoughts regarding the proposed contract extension. Over the past 11 months, you've accomplished more than I could have ever expected. To highlight some of your accomplishments include, and I won't read them all, but they listed several ones I've already commented on. He goes, I could go on and on, and I apologize that some of the above achievements have already been addressed by other board members. Mike, in short, my vote is an enthusiastic, humble, and grateful yes. Uh, I would be honored if you would accept the proposed contract extension as outlined by President Wasserman. So uh, just want to show it, what Scott had to say. And mm -hmm. Scott has personally told me, and he has said it at this table, so I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, feel like I'm divulging something I shouldn't divulge. 
uh, he'll, he'll constantly remind Mike that he was the one that was skeptical of Mike <laughs> 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 when he first hired on, and, and he says, now, now I'm one of Mike's biggest fans. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I just wanted to point that out. And I'll just pile on and say, Mike, um, as president board, you have a different relationship with the superintendent, uh, you always do, especially with the hiring superintendent. And I've appreciated your candor. I've appreciated your cut through the morass of, I'll call it bureaucracy, just to get to the point. And not just cutting through it, but taking other people through it. And I get uh, great comments from people in the community that have met with you as you discuss issues and how you can get to the point very quickly with them. And, and that's a highly appreciated skill. And I think that reflects the communication skill that Pam was alluding to. So uh, as we have to go forward quickly and boldly, um, I'm, I think you've got skill sets, so I'm more than glad to have you and more than glad to keep you. <laughs> and as a consequence, we'll ask for a vote to try to keep Mike for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so end of comments. With that said, um, we'll, do a, we'll just do a voice vote. All in favor of the contract extension as outlined, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? None in opposition? Uh, unanimous vote. Congratulations, Mike, and thank Bless. you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and thank you very much for having me. And um, it's one of my most dreaded moments sitting here because I think my parents were, would be sitting down and saying always to me, remain humble and go get the job done. And so I don't need many, <laughs> I don't need many pats on the back. We have a lot of work to do, and let's get back at it and go do the good stuff we need to do for the kids in the middle public schools. Well, thank you. We look forward to that. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, we are um, to construction manager, and um, we had we had put the RFP out uh, almost probably almost a month ago now, and we had seven uh, proposals in. Linda and I reviewed those and try to make those a manageable group to bring in to the FFO. Uh, we kind of had our mind um, three, and when we got done, it felt like two of them was right, and so we brought in McCarthy and Smith, and the Barton Mallow Corporation, which um, I think the FFO committee would say, and I certainly would that um, boy, both proposals were great and both companies interviewed well. So yeah. there was no negative in the, the meeting we had that day. But I think we all quickly somehow came to the same conclusion that the fit was right uh, in, with Barton Mallow Corporation. So we're making that recommendation to you today to approve Barton Mallow to become the construction manager that French and Associations Associates are seeking in order to do the full uh, estimating of after they review our, our buildings and what may be needed out there. So with that, I will entertain a motion for uh, the selection of uh, Barton Mallow as our construction manager for this uh, facilities evaluation. So moved. Support. Okay. <laughs> John and Angela. And uh, now I'll move to any questions or comments. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the process uh, being at the FFO meeting. Uh, we, uh, we had asked a lot of detailed questions of the firms, and um, I thought that Barton Mallow performed really well when uh, asked about the challenges when things didn't go right, and how do they resolve problems and work through difficulties, and they had a broad range of experience, and uh, it was I was very happy with, uh, in particular, how strongly they answered those questions, and I think Mr. Wasserman had asked those, because you have some background in some of these projects, and. Me being a healthcare guy, uh, I know about one building. I don't know about many, many buildings that change all the time. So, uh, but I was really impressed. But the and both interviewed well. But I think the strengths of uh, Bart and Mallow was a better fit for MPS. Well, and I think these are these are firms that specialize in educational buildings. So, with pairing them with French and Associates when they're looking at estimates to give us some good um, numbers on what some things might take, um, needs that we have in the district. I think we. We'll be able to have some confidence in their numbers that they come up with. And I'll repeat, I won't repeat what John said about uh, answering the tough questions that they did, a, they did a great job and didn't sugarcoat. Because you know, if anybody says, oh, there's never problems, then they're off my list before the, before <laughs> the, the vote even starts. Um, but the other thing I really liked about Barb Mallow, so that the public hears that, they're going to nest, is it three? Three individuals? Correct. Here so in the community, full time during the assessment period, and then beyond if we are successful in, in, in changing buildings. So um, I was very impressed with their, their not only willingness, we didn't have to ask, they, that was their process, and they, they really wanted to do that. So that was very heartening to see that they're going to own this thing from day one. I had some questions from some community members 
about the process going forward. We wrote about it a little bit today in Monday's communique. So again, you know, we're hoping to get what the experts are saying these buildings need and estimates so we can have the discussion to figure out what might the community think of those things and what might they support and what might they not in order to go forward. Yeah, and options. Options. Right. And options. Just looking at what we want to be. Mm -hmm. can, can I add one thing is that we did discuss at length technology and innovative 21st mm -hmm. century learning and there was some very good comments about uses of space, space. how collaboration, how education is maybe not going to be in small little classrooms and have some very flexible spaces out there. Yep. Which um, doing any sort of improvements to the building, we have to think about how they're not going to be used just now, how they're going to be used 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And I think that that was answered to our satisfaction yep. also as well. Any others? With that, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of the selection of Barton Mallow, say aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. Turn it over to uh, curriculum instruction, and I think the first thing we have is a study committee meeting minutes from Lynn. Yes, we met on Monday, May 12th, and uh, we visited the Building Trades House over on Wac or, uh, Haley Street, which is always a favorite meeting of, of the year. Kevin Dodick, Building Trades teacher, and Bill Brown, City of Midland Building Department Liaison discuss the overall building trades project in partnership for the 2013-14 school year. This year's partnership, similar to previous years, include the City of Midland and the Reese Endeavor of Midland. The 22 students enrolled in the building trades program met the challenge of completing the 2200 square foot duplex style residence on East Haley Street even with all the weather related delays. Both sides of the duplex are constructed with a universal access design to meet the needs of a variety of potential residents. The entire residence is built in compliance with the American Disabilities Act. Standards is a handicap accessible, barrier free, and zero step home. In the final weeks of the school year, students will be putting the final touches on the interior and exterior of the home and property. In addition, some of the Winning Mites projects from the welding and woodworking programs were on display at the house for viewing. MPS has multiple award winning Mites projects this year. So I would just encourage people, if you're out and about, to uh, Go down Haley Street, it's uh, built right kind of behind uh, the uh, Disability Network and Habitat for Humanity. Uh, it's a lovely home. It hasn't been landscaped yet, but the one next door is a mirror image and uh, beautiful. And the work inside, the, the craftsmanship and the workmanship is absolutely beautiful. I could move into a house like that tomorrow. So. <laughs> Any questions for Lynn? I thought the universal access was such a plus and talking to the instructors they were saying um, other members across um, in different communities were asking them and coming to them for yeah. ideas on, on how to build mm -hmm. homes with the universal access and uh, it was it was exciting to see. Mm -hmm. Any others? Okay with that I'll hand it over to Mr. Cooper. I have uh, two pieces of items for you tonight just for information. First one, we'll come back to you yet here in June, and you heard mentioned earlier one of the presentations about school improvement plans, and it's that time of year. So the district school improvement committee has uh, reviewed both the district level plan and the individual building plans, given feedback back to the schools, and the schools have resubmitted those plans. Uh, they would be available if anyone wanted to look at them in detail outside uh, my office, but as we always do, the law. We'll require you as a board to approve the district plan in each of those building plans, and we'll do that at the next uh, board meeting, so those items will, will come back to you. The other item is uh, for the 28-day examination period. Uh, we have textbooks uh, in the areas of uh, the IB Math HL2 and AP Calculus BC, uh, Computer Programming 1A and Computer Programming 2A, and also in Life Management uh, 7, which is a seventh grade one. And those, like always, are outside my office for examination for the 28-day period. And those go back to you in July. Any questions for Bob? Seeing none, we'll move to finance. We have a FFO committee meeting report from John. Yes, we do. We met on June 2nd um, with myself, uh, Ms. Branstad, Mr. Wasserman, Mr. Sherrill, Linda Klein, Carol Oakes, and then um, Bob Cooper. And uh, Mike Mogenberger had joined us for a limited amount of time at the meeting. 
Uh, Ms. Lelix reviewed the April financial report. There was a question about why there's no admission fee for most spring athletic events. Uh, the athletic directors will be asked about the feasible of charging. Ms. Klein reported that only two bids were received for the former Mills Elementary property. After considerable discussion, it was the superintendent's recommendation that we wait until the conclusion of the facility study before proceeding. The bidders would be notified that their bids were rejected. Since there is no clear guidance from Lansing regarding next year's state aid amounts, the group discussed budget strategies in the event that there is no action before the budget has to be finalized on Friday morning. I think we went through a lot of this with uh, Mrs. Klein's presentation. Um, since the executive proposal is closest in structure, this one that we went after. Uh, from 5 until 7 p.m., the group met with representatives of two of seven construction management, which we talked about, and uh, with the selection of Barton Mallow. Um, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, September 3rd uh, at 4.15. Copies of the minutes are out in the hallway. Any questions or comments, John? Seeing none, I'll turn it to Linda. We have a number of gifts this evening. They total $21,790.30. And I know that some of them are actually deferred until next year. Some are covering 13, 14 purchases, but many of them the buildings have asked to carry over because of the, the late timing in the year. Uh, Dow Chemical Company Foundation supported youth and government at Dow High School. Midland High School Athletic Booster Club donated a number of items for a variety of sports, as did the H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club. Adams Elementary received a grant from the National Energy Foundation. Jefferson Parent Advisory Committee purchased an ice machine for Jefferson. Uh, the National Energy Foundation also provided a grant to Plymouth Elementary. And the Midland Kiwanis Foundation supported classroom mini grants at Plymouth, Chestnut Hill, and East Lawn. Uh, one gift does require your acceptance this evening. It is for $12,000 from the Midland High School Athletic Booster Club. And that is to cover 2013-14 entry fees for contests. I will entertain a motion on item 6.3. I motion to accept uh, item 6.3, the acceptance of the $12,000 from Midland High for entry fees for athletics. Do we have support. support? Support by Lynn. Any questions or comments on that or the other donations? I think it's just wonderful that we have a booster club that will uh, help both high schools in supporting their athletics and taking some of the burden off the, the school system when we're tight on budget. I echo loudly that, and uh, it's it's great uh, the participation. And you see in the booster bash now, the, everybody playing together to bring the whole thing up. It's wonderful. Any others? With that, take a vote. All in favor, accepting the gift, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Moving it to human resources. Am I taking it to you, Mike? I guess so, unless one of you guys were planning. I was going to say, I, my microphone is on. I can do it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, we have a staff member who has announced her retirement, effective July 31, 2014. That is Catherine H. Janacek. She is the manager of the Science Resources Center. And then under the terms of the current contract between the Board of Education of the Midland Public Schools and the Midland City Education Association, a contract lease has been granted to Ms. Viola Collin, the president of the MCEA, for the 2014-15 school year, and that is August 25th, 2014 through June 11th, 2015. Any questions for Linda? Seeing none, your agenda show the next scheduled meetings, uh, one in June, one in July, and one in August, and one each month <laughs> thereafter <laughs> till mid-year. <laughs> uh, that reflects our new schedule. Um, at this point, we'll go to study discussion of members, and I will start to my right with Pam. Well, I got to start with graduation and commencement. Uh, it was wonderful ceremony. I was at the Midland High, and I heard the Dow High uh, ceremony was equally as wonderful. Uh, I wish all the graduates well in their next endeavors, and um, also the, there were several students uh, that we saw stand up that are going into the military and just uh, how admirable I feel that is and, and what, a, what a gift they're giving our country. I'm excited about the preschool at Adams and uh, I w I'm interested to 
hear more and more information on how that's progressing. And uh, I will All leave right. it to you. Yes, it was another fabulous Friday night with graduation. Um, I'm just always so impressed. I know I um, was at Dow High and Pam gets up and just tells a lot of the accomplishments of the students and it's just so amazing um, what these kids have accomplished and then this year it stuck in my mind she always announces um, at Dow High they um, students were offered over eight million dollars mm -hmm. worth of scholarships and that just to me is overwhelming and um, such a testament to what we provide here for them and then um, just want to take this opportunity on a personal note to thank um, all my children's teachers again this year it's just been just a fabulous year for them and I just every year I'm more and more amazed at just not the basics of what they're learning but when I look at some of the projects that they've done and just some of the I guess you would call them extensions things that I'm like wow we you know I don't ever remember doing those types of things when I was in school and it um, just it really helps them you know it teaches them how to think not just how to rote memorize things and it's just it's been another fabulous year. Okay. On to you, Ben. Uh, on to me, okay. Um, just, you know, a couple comments on budget. And, you know, it's been years of reductions and, you know, millions of dollars. It's not enough to, you know, make the money in with the money out. Um, all those years that that's occurred, we've kept achieving up in this district. And I know we've got more work to do on that. And I definitely think that. We're going to continue to keep kids achieving graduation. As those kids walk across the, the stage, their achievement was high, the scholarships, the, the accomplishments. But a lot of those students had been through a number of years of reductions. And I nef definitely think that we are going to do what it takes, no matter what the financial challenge is. As the treasurer for the board, we will continue to get that job done. It's going to be a challenge, but the achievement and success of MPS will continue, no matter what the financial challenges are. So I just wanted to get that out. Not that it's going to be easy, or try to sugarcoat it. Um, I was really impressed with some of the innovations and solutions for the district coming from within and with the presentations tonight. I think that's great. Um, I'm glad that we've minimized personal personnel reductions with uh, the effect on as few people as possible. That That's really important, I know, to all of us. Uh, real people with real effects on their lives. Um, and with the contact with our legislators about the budget and finances. I know we do have regular mechanisms in place. We do meet with our legislators on a regular basis. We do contact our legislators. You know, we could always contact them more, but that mechanism's in place. We continue to uh, get updates from Michigan Association of School Boards, but also, Mike, you keep us posted. There's, there's always legislation I I going on. You know, there's always something related to budget and so forth. Um, but we do get those regular updates, and, uh, and we, we act on those. Um, and then thank you to the MPS team getting us through another year. I mean, everybody, it takes, it takes a whole team to make that happen. And uh, I'm very thankful that we've got a team that's able to work together despite the changes, doing more with less and producing the quality. And then uh, lastly, just have a safe summer. I just want to say also congratulations to all the graduates and best wishes to all of you. And thank you for uh, letting me be part of handing you your diplomas. I get such a charge out of that. That is so much fun. So anyway, that was great. Um, also, I just want to say once more that our teachers just never cease to amaze me. These teachers from Seabird here tonight, I'm just, I just can't get over the things they can do. They're just amazing to me. So I really enjoyed their presentation tonight. Also, I've forgotten how it's been so long that we've been here. Um, oh, the ones from uh, where did they come from? Northeast. Northeast. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, the iPad initiative. Wow, that was really exciting too. And it just to, uh, those kids were so excited about what they do. I thought that was great. I could just really feel. I felt like I was there with them doing it. So thanks to all of them. That's it. Well, I would um, start with graduation as well. It's just <laughs> always so much fun, and it's fun to see the students go across the stage, and they all. Some of them have big grins, some of them are nervous. And <laughs> you, you look at them and just think, you know, what is the next path that they'll be taking in their life? And I know at Midland High, Pam didn't mention it, but one of the highlights was her being able to hand her daughter Becca the, her diploma, which is I've been able to do a couple times, and that is makes it even extra special. So I was glad you got to do that, Pam. Um, and let's see, uh, we mentioned tonight the 2014 Education Excellence Award that was given to Missy DeBoer and, and Dow High School. And Pam and I really had a 
and Mike was there, and and we had a a, a great afternoon going and and being a part of that. They were one of twenty awards giving in the state, and it was fascinating just to hear all the what the other schools and other awards were as well. But something that we can be very proud of, and uh, going forward, I'm sure we we could be honored for many more of our innovative programs, I, as we saw tonight with Northeast and uh, Siebert. And I, I want to thank you, Mike, for bringing, bringing these uh, teachers and students. It's, it's, it's really fun. It's inspiring and it's energizing to see their enthusiasm and, and all the neat things that they're doing. Um, and I think, let's see, the last thing, I've been driving around town and seeing field days and picnics oh. and Mike was over outside. I drove by Carpenter today, and kids were doing math with sidewalk chalk, and Mike was walking up and down the sidewalk at lunchtime today. So teachers are using uh, this great weather in these last couple days of, I'm sure, uh, very interesting classroom behavior and excitement as they face the last couple of days of school. And uh, on that note, good luck to our uh, high schoolers with exams. A couple more days, and then I wish everybody a great summer. Time to relax, re-energize, and uh, look forward to another great year. I'm going to keep mine short. Oh, oh. Two, 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 oh man, to go longer? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I accept the motion to extend the meeting 15 minutes? So moved. Second. Se second by Pam. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> all opposed? <laughs> We're going to keep going. Now. Can't get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Mikey, thought you were going to get away. <laughs> um, just congratulations all the graduates. Like everybody else has said, it's it's one of the joyful <coughs> things as board members we get to do. And I've said this to parents for 10 years. Y you hear a lot of kids saying, I don't care, you know, walking through graduation. Well, I'll tell you, when I get done, I need I need a 55-gallon bucket of uh, hand sanitizer because these kids are excited, <laughs> nervous, <laughs> energized. You, you pick whatever word you want to do, but they are not ambivalent. <laughs> and it, it's just great to see that, that it means that much to them after, after their, as they go through their life change. And Pam, congratulations. There's nothing, there is nothing uh, more joyous as a board member than handing your child their diploma. And uh, I, 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 I'm just uh, pleased that you got to do that. And uh, I want to thank the staff for another great school year and uh, enthusiasm and take the summer to, to refresh and detox. And I just want to point to the presentation by Siebert, I hope as a board and as at least one board member and I know as our superintendent over here to create an environment where you can innovate and try some things and do those kind of things. And I hope that's what we can supply you as staff as we go forward. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank the weatherman and I think our whole staff would like to thank the weatherman because these 68 and 75 degree days uh, as we go into June and mid-June have been wonderful. And I am sure uh, that has uh, really enabled some of the things in the classroom to happen that may not happen if it hit 80s. So Only this Mike. week we're thanking him. Yes. <laughs> Back that caused not the winter. Day. Yeah, not the winter. Uh, yep. uh, real quick. Our third edition of the uh, Our Schools newsletter was out with the New England Daily News um, mm -hmm. this weekend. If you didn't get a chance to see that, we have extra copies in the administration building as well as any of you that would like to distribute those. I think we already hit John's office. So, <laughs> you know, uh, any offices that you can put them in. They and read them. Yes, they, they do. do. So we get that Very information well out there. Uh, we are working away at the preschool program. Lots of things going on. Brian, Linda, and, and Luann are working real hard. Um, kind of threw that one quick talk about moving fast they would agree with that when I decided to go ahead and move forward so but we're getting there and we're definitely thinking we're going to be open in time the biggest part is the whole certification of the room piece of it that's kind of we can't say we're there until we get that piece done so um, transportation staff I wrote to you about how we had reorganized that and that really came from our people which is really nice and so um, Jim Valerie's retiring and we have two other employees out there uh, Linda and Bob met with them and it was a little bit their idea and Linda and Bob did a little bit of thinking on it and we we're going to go ahead and go forward uh, with those two save money with Jim. They will need a third person support but at a much lower pay wage and in order to do this and so we look forward to trying transportation in a different way next year and continue to get a little smaller and reduce those costs. So another way of reducing costs as we go. Um, it's been a long time since we had our last meeting, so this one's quite old. Let's see if you remember. NEOLA board policies oh, right. yep. is on electronically, 
and that we've only opened it up at this point to cabinet and you to take a look and see how that's working. When we feel like it's really good to go for the public, it'll, it'll go onto our website as a link to find our board policies. Real searchable, real easy to search. So if you haven't had a chance to play in there, please do as you go forward. Um, we did get receive our high school MME ACT scores. They're embargoed still, so they're not um, available for to be released to you, I can just tell you that there's some highs and lows. There's a, it's a mixed bag, and so um, some highs and lows, and uh, they're already analyzing and moving fast at both high schools with the curriculum department and trying to use that data to drive where they're going next year as well. And um, the, we pushed real hard to uh, Linda work with Chartwells, and we're going to have two uh, of our buildings providing meals this summer. So Carpenter is, make sure I say this right, both meals? I can't remember, do you, Linda? Lunch. Lunch, Carpenter is lunch, and uh, East Lawn is both meals. Uh, East Lawn is lunch, and actually, the, we've community also partnered center. with the community center. My fault. And so summer feeding will be available for anyone within this area at the Curling Center, will be the site for any students who would like a lunch. And speaking of innovative programs, um, the, the, we worked a little bit our e with our ESA, something that, uh, an idea that when I came in, kind of um, met Jimmy Green, we met Jimmy, hit, talking about contagious personality, uh, his enthusiasm, and, and uh, we've partnered with Greater Michigan Construction Academy to, to provide our students interested in construction field with an opportunity next year, kind of a dual enrollment. Um, Don Johnson's headed that up through our ESA and did a wonderful job, so all four county schools will be participating in that opportunity for kids next year. That's all I have. Great. That's great. Anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, we are adjourned.